All right, so we're back again. Welcome to Christ Center Discussions. It's Wednesday, March the 10th, 2021. And we're now in our 36th study into the book of Revelation. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless this food that we're about ready to receive. May we be filled, nourished, and strengthened by you, this food. Give us this day our daily bread, our daily portion of your Son, Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. All right, so we saw Monday, the 144,000 with Christ, they were standing on Mount Zion. We related this 144,000 to the ones that were in Revelation chapter 7, same group of people. These men have chosen celibacy to be led by God and to allow God to work through them. And I really don't have the time to cover everything we did last Monday. So just, I'm going to pick up where we left. And if you missed it, get the recording. Okay, so we left off in verse 6. So let's just start there. We'll get to verse 11, I think, tonight. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. And they followed another angel, and there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she had made the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive the mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out with mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. Right, there's a lot in these scriptures. But it starts off by John seeing another angel flying in the midst of heaven. It's another angel. And I link this angel, I link it back to Revelation chapter 8 and verse 13, where it says, And behold, and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, whoa, whoa. So these angels are pronouncing judgment. And we see three of them here. Now, the everlasting gospel to preach. The good news, right? The gospel that has no end. The gospel of Jesus Christ. And this angel flying in the midst of heaven, he has this everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell on the earth, those who sit on the earth. And it's a different Greek word here that used before to mean dwell on the earth. It's a completely different Greek word. These are not people who are just living on the earth, right? They're setting down on the earth. This means that they have taken up residency in the earth. They have established earth as their home. Okay. Now notice that after the mark of the mark of the beast, it's not earth dwellers anymore, but it's those that set on the earth. They become a permanent setter on the earth. I know that sounds funny, but that's the way the Greek is. And I'm not sure why the change in the Greek word, but I still wanted to point that out. It's kind of interesting if you ask me. So, And it's also interesting that this ever, everlasting gospel is being preached to these setters on the earth. Listen to the scriptures in Matthew 24 and verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. Okay, we see it in Mark chapter 13, 10. And the gospel must be published. The, the gospel must first be published among all nations. So right here, I believe this is the fulfillment of Mark and Matthew. Right, right here in chapter 14. Everyone on the earth will hear this gospel. Everyone. And this is why every nation and tongue will hear the gospel. Fulfilling Matthew 24, 14 and Mark 13, 10. Every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Now, 
Some want to debate on what's being preached here. And that's okay. Debate it. I mean, I don't have an issue with it. But some believe that when the when the rapture occurs, okay, there's going to be the rapture that happens, that it can't be the same gospel preached. And I totally disagree. It's not a different gospel. So I'm just going to get this straight once and for all. If you notice, this is an angel preaching it as well, right? Do angels preach? Well, remember what Paul said, Galatians, Galatians 1 and verse 8. But though we or another angel from heaven preach any other gospel, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which you, we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. It's the same gospel. Otherwise, let them be accursed, right? If an angel from heaven preaches any other gospel, it's the same gospel. So, number one, same gospel. Okay, and the fact that this gospel is called the everlasting gospel, right? Everlasting, right? In fact, it, it assures us that this is the same gospel being, being preached. And the fact that an angel is preaching it, we must conclude it's the same gospel, as an angel would, would not preach a different gospel according to scripture. All right. Get it? Got it? Good. Okay, now we're jumping into verse 7. Yeah, verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made the heaven and the earth, the sea, the fountains of the water. So. The gospel of grace is is also the gospel of judgment, right? Fear God, give him glory, for the hour of judgment is come, right? Believe it or not, the Bible is not all of this mushy, gushy, purple dinosaur, Barney, I love, 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 love you, right? The Bible is also about judgment. Praise God that we are free from this judgment, Right? If you receive Jesus Christ, you are free from this judgment. But if you do not, you will receive this judgment poured out upon a Christ-rejecting world, as we're going to see later on with the third angel. All right? God is just to judge because he knows what is right. Who can say God's unfair? God knows all and judges those that are not his. All right, when John the Baptist began his ministry, let's, let's look what he said in Matthew 3, 6, or 3, 7, and 8. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come into his baptism, he said unto, he said unto them, O oh, you generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. So John's message was also judgment. And listen to how he goes on in verse 10. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which brings not forth good fruit is honed down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not even worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with Holy Ghost and fire, whose fan in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Amen. If you spend any time in the word of God, you will truly worship God for loving us enough to save us from this judgment and unquenchable fire. When you realize that you, what, what you've been redeemed from, it should change you. But people don't talk about the judgment or hell anymore. It's Barneyism. People don't want to talk about the gospel anymore. People get saved and they don't even realize what they've been saved from. Judgment, wrath, torment, day upon day upon day forever. Just like the burning bush that we read about. That burning bush was never consumed. It was on fire, but it was never consumed. Right? We've been saved from that. A fire that burns and burns and burns that's never consumed. And that's what Christ came. That's why he came. 
This is what we're saved from. This is the reason he came. And it's why it's important for us to tell others about hell, just as important as it is to tell them about heaven and eternity. It's why it's important to make Christ a full-time position for eternity instead of a half-time position for comfort. Barneyism is good and all. I'm not putting it down, but there, we must also have teachings about the judgment of God. We should never leave out any characteristics of our God. The, and the gospel leads up to the final resting place for those who do, do not accept him, who do not listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ and accept it. And that's what it's all leading up to. So I think it's important people understand this. Okay, back to verse, verse 7, Revelation 14, 7. Saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him. The hour of judgment's come. Worship him that made heaven, earth, the sea, the fountains. Okay, fear God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. We fear policemen, right? Do we fear God the same way? All right. When you run that red light, and I'm sure all of us have accidentally done it, or we run a stoplight, or we knew we did something wrong, a lot of us freak out. Look around. Is there a cop around? Because you're afraid a cop's going to see you and write you a ticket. Right. So your heart starts beating. Ah. Especially if you do that and you know a cop's back there, your heart's going to start beating. I guarantee you. Does your heart beat that fast? Or faster if you do something wrong in the eyes of God. We fear police because they have authority, right? But sometimes we don't even fear God who has the ultimate authority. Hebrews 10.31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Okay, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, right? Give glory to him for who he is. Do all for the glory of God. No matter what happens or what you do, give him glory. Exalt who he is. Know him. Walk with him. And, ab and he will absolutely blow you away with who he is when you start learning who he is and what he's done for you in scriptures. Why should we do this? For the hour of his judgment has come. And we've been seeing God's wrath so far in the book of Revelation, but this is the first time we see the idea of God's judgment, right? It is linked with giving him glory. God's judgment exalts the righteousness of God, and that's the reason we give him glory. And it's interesting that it's not the righteousness of God in saving sinners, but the righteousness of God in judging those who are condemned, it's a turnaround there, and what a turnaround, right? When was the last time we praised God for righteously judging those who have transgressed against him and does not know him? <clears throat> give him glory for the honor and give him glory for the hour of judgment. It's come. Praise God for his righteous judgment. And then it says, worship him. Rejoicing in him. This is, this is falling on your face before God. Like a dog list, licking his master's feet and worshiping his master. This isn't about just the music and the Broadway shows. This is a lifestyle. Not only worshiping him when all is going well, but when the, the, these different trials and tribulations come our way, we still worship him we need to be worshipers of god worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water we worship him because he's the creator of all things right god created this world for us i believe god created us last so that we would be able to enjoy the creation he gave us it was all planned out. It was all made. He's like, here it is. I'm going to put man here and I'm going to give it to him. So we, we need, do we see creation that way? Do we look around and take time to notice the creation of God around us? I think Nehemiah really understood this. Nehemiah um, 
chapter 9, verse 5 and 6. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashabnia, Sherebiah, Hodajah, Shebaniah, <laughs> Pethahiah, and I get those names all. I should study them out before I did the study, but you guys can get the Hebrew and, and learn them too. So, But uh, they said, stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all and all blessing and praise, right? Thou, even thou art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven and the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein. And thou preserves them all. And the host of heaven worship you, right? Nehemiah understood worship. Worship God, praise him in all things. All right, now let's jump to verse 8, Revelation 14, 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink the wine of her wrath of her fornication. Now, I want, I want you to notice the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth here, right? Because she made all nations to drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Right now in verse 10, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture and the cup of his indignation. So it's an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth going on here. Okay, and when we get to chapter 17 and 18, we're going to see more of this idea of Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Right now, uh, I'm going to take us to the Old Testament background for this verse. And that is in Isaiah chapter 21 and verse 9. And behold, there comes a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And all the graven images of her gods he has broken unto the ground. So the idea of fallen is fallen. It's an expression and it's expressing the future occurrence of the fall of Babylon as if it had already happened. Right? In the Hebrew, anytime you have the word repeated as well, it's for emphasis. Right? The city of Babylon shows up in Genesis chapter 10, the Tower of Babel. And if we look at the Bible, it could be shown as the tale of two cities. Right, The city of Babylon, which is the building of man's way, and the city of Jerusalem, which is the building of God's way. What are the last two cities you get in the book of Revelation? Babylon and Jerusalem. Babylon is going to be both a political and religious capital of the world in the future, or better yet, I believe the Roman Catholic Church be a big part of this. Now, don't take me wrong, I'm not against Catholics, but I am against systems. I'm against systems. And there is not a single political entity in this world that is stronger than the Vatican. Vatican City has the most political power in our world. And with all of this in mind, I believe that Babylon is going to be the Roman Catholic Church. It's going to be their religious system. And if you remember in, in Isaiah chapter 13 and 14, Jeremiah chapter 50 and 51, and then we see in Revelation 17 and 18, we're going to see this very clearly. Babylon is also a literal city that's in modern day Iraq. And in those chapters, you're going you're gonna, you're gonna to find that Babylon is utterly destroyed and it will never, ever be inhabited again. Right? But guess what? Saddam Hussein spent millions of dollars. And if you go to modern day Babylon right now in Iraq, there's castles, there's walls. Right? And in order for the Bible to be fulfilled, Babylon must fall. And I believe it's also literal Babylon. Babylon's a city that's never been conquered or destroyed yet. People went in and, and they sort of conquered it, but it never was totally leveled. It never got completely and utterly destroyed. So Babylon needs to get to a point where it is uninhabitable. Right? It's possible that the Antichrist will put his political and religious reign in Rome in the city of Babylon. Don't know. 
the fact that Saddam Hussein re rebuilt the city is kind of interesting, and I, I want to point that out. So maybe the Antichrist will set up camp in the city of Babylon. And there's no doubt that the Antichrist will have the backing of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church is the largest religious and political group in the world. And I guarantee you, the Antichrist will not be able to do what he wants to do and what he's going to do without the Roman Catholic Church backing him up. Rome is going to back him up. And we also know that in, the Antichrist is going to be of Roman descent because we read that from Daniel chapter 9. Right? Some believe he's going to be the Pope. I'm not going to go that far. I actually believe the Pope is going to be the false prophet. Now, anything's possible, right? Who knows? This is all just second guess here. We do the best we can to put it together. But it's very possible that he could be the Pope. But he's going to rise out of the Roman Catholic Church and have the backing of the European Union, the revived Roman Empire. The Antichrist will be of Roman descent, and I believe he's also going to have to have some type of Jewish ancestry as well. We talked about that in one of our earlier, earlier lessons. Where he comes from, I don't know. He could be Middle Eastern that rises up through the, the Catholic Church. He may come from the Middle East. I, 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 nobody knows. We can just put our own flip on this, right? our own understanding of it. But truly, nobody knows everything. And, right, we don't even know who the Antichrist is going to be until it's revealed, right? So, all right. So, look what happens to Babylon, uh, 14 and verse 8. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is falling, is fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of her wrath of her fornication. So, the doctrine of Babylon starts in Genesis chapter 10, Isaiah 13 and 14, Jeremiah 50, 51, and Revelation 17 and 18. So, go read up on those, right? Read those chapters. It will give you a lot more information and understanding of Revelation about Babylon, we just don't have time to go over all of that. But I will jump over to Isaiah 51 and just read a few verses here from 6 to 9. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Talking about Babylon. Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. And we'll get to the golden cup later. In Revelation, Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that had made all earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. Right? They're not mad uh, because they drunk of the wine. The wine has made them mad. Okay, let's get that right. Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. How for her, or well for her, take balm for her pain, if so, be she may be healed. Right? We would have helped Babylon, or we would have healed Babylon. I need new glasses. We would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her, and let us go every one into his own country. For her judgment reaches unto heaven, and is lifted up even to the skies. So notice that Babylon was a golden cup in the in, in whose hand? In God's hand. Right? It made all the earth drunk, and the nations have drank her wine, and they're mad. They're, they're deranged. Really is what that word mad is. They're 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 deranged. And and also know that Babylon thinks it's doing what it wants to do. Its own way. <laughs> right? I wish people could get this. God's in control. God is the one doing this. He is in control of everything. And that is why it makes the comment about being in the Lord's hand. Right? You're in my hand. I control you. You don't control me. Right? They think they're doing it, but God's doing it. And I just real quickly want to bring that up. When we say we're never going to do something... We're telling God that, hey, I'm in control. I can choose not to do that. 
I'll never do it. Just like Peter. I will never deny you, Lord. Never. And guess what? Peter wasn't in control. And what did he do? He denied him three times. It's the same with us. Don't ever say never, never, I'll never, I'll never, I'll never. And I know this from experience. Many times I've said never do this and I ended up doing it. Right? We need to understand tonight that God is in control of our lives. He's the potter, we're the clay. We don't tell the potter what to do. Keep that in mind. All right, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen the great city because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So now we're going to jump to 1 John. All right, and we're going to 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to read 15, 16, and 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. So Babylon, this anti-God, political and religious system, it promotes the things of the world. They do not promote the things of God. And if you're a child of God and you're partaking of the things of the world, we need to change that, right? Those who love God loves the things of God. If you really love God, you're going to love what God loves and despise what God despises. What happens though is that so-called Christians, I want to say so-called here, they drink up Babylon's wine, they partake of her fornication, and then they go to God and say, I love you, Lord, right? <laughs> so many people do this. Babylon has fallen. The, fornica the fornication is going to be judged, but the things of God are going to last forever. And we're going to see more of that in chapter 7 and 18 about this golden cup. But let's move on to the third angel. Okay, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receives his mark in the forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, full strength, pretty much, not diluted, into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. All right. So if this is interesting here, because in Revelation chapter 13, we see man's view, right? That anyone that didn't take the mark would be killed. That's man's view. But now we have God's view. If you receive his mark, you're going to be killed. Right? You're going to drink the wine of the wrath of God and be killed. This, is definite, this definitely shows us that the price to be paid for choosing the Babylon political and religious system is not worth it. Right? The people who choose to save their lives will lose their life. But the Word of God tells us to lose our lives is to save them. Right? These people who worship the beast, worship his image, and receive this mark, they're going to die. The person that does this will drink of the wine of the wrath of God that is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. This is like drinking something very bitter and you don't want it, but will be forced down your throat. That's what's going to happen. If you take the mark, you're going to be forced to drink the wine of the wrath of God. Simple as that. And notice there's two wines that we've talked about. We've talked about Babylon's wine and God's wine, right? His wrath. Listen to Psalm. Psalms chapter 75 and verse 8. 
For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and he pours out of the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. We also see this in Isaiah uh, chapter 51 and 17. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. Okay, and one more in Jeremiah 25, 15. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of his fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I see, send thee to drink it. All right. This poured out in full strength into the cup of his indignation literally means that it is pure wrath. Right? We talk about the gold, heating it up to scrape the impurities off. Well, God's gold is pure. This wrath is pure. In the Greek, it, it's unmixed, it's undiluted. It means that there is nothing else added to it. It's not watered down. That's what they did with wine. They'd watered it down. It's the pure wrath of God. God is not holding anything back. The people that do not receive Christ and those that take the mark will have nothing held back on them when this pure wrath of God comes upon the world. In other words, and many ain't going to like this, but there's not going to be any mercy. There ain't going to be any mercy at this time. People need to know this. People need to understand this. This is going to be devastating. People need to know that if they do not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior here and now and love God, there's going to be no dilution. It will be the full strength of God's wrath, God's indignation. It will not be watered down. They're going to get all of it. No mercy. We need to quit straddling fences and get serious with God. Now look at the second half of verse 10 and 11. And it should be something, to me, this just blows my mind. Um, I didn't see it the first time I read Revelation, but I did notice it as I continued to study Revelation. But listen to what it says here. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in, in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. Okay, this is the fire that doesn't consume, okay? Kind of like the burning bush. Uh, it's the fire that burns, but it does not destroy what it's burning. These people will not be destroyed by this fire. They're going to be tormented by it. And look who's there with them. The angels and the Lamb. This torment that goes on forever and ever, they're in the presence of the angels and the Lamb. Jesus will be in their presence. He'll be in the presence of those that are tormented. Don't tell me this is all Barneyism. This is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that took the sins of the world away. He doesn't wish anyone to perish. Why? Because this is going to happen to them and he's going to be there seeing it. That'd be like seeing your son roasting it in a fire. It's torment. I wouldn't want to see that. I know Jesus doesn't want to see it. It's going to consume, but it will never, ever destroy. It will always burn. And I think this is why David said in Psalm 6, or, or I mean, uh, Psalms 139 and 8, if I ascend into heaven, you're there with me. And if I make my bed in hell, <laughs> behold, thou art there. And that's what's going on right here. These people will be burning in torment forever. And the angels and the Lamb of God will be there watching it. These people who reject Jesus and are judged to this place, they're going to know who Jesus is. 
This is why Paul says that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And this is not only about people believing in Jesus, but it's about those who are in judgment. They're going to be realize that Jesus is the Lord and they were wrong. Well, every single day, every single night, they're being tormented. This does not diminish Christ or take away from his love. It, it exalts the awesomeness and the glory of God that Jesus Christ as judge is righteous to stand and watch that judgment of the ones who did not accept him. Tell me this is ever taught in your churches today. People need to get this. They need to know that whether they go to heaven or they go to the pits of hell, they're going to know Jesus Christ. And that he's going to be there watching them as they're tormented with this uncrenchable fire. I mean, we love to hear about the, the love of God, and I do too, the love, but, but we, we don't want to talk about his judgments. Love includes judgments. Why do, you, why do you discipline your children? Because you love them. So discipline and judging is part of love. But people just want to talk about the grace and the love of Jesus Christ, but it's also about judgment. This is who Jesus is. This is who our Lord is. And do you see him that way? Do we fear him that way? This kind, this kind of opens, opens, it should open your eyes to the verses that are in the word that tells us about the rich man seeing Lazarus too, right? Jesus is going to see all the Lazaruses and he'll be present. The rich man. Watching over them forever and ever. The rich man cried out for mercy, but he didn't receive any. I hope this opens the door even in my life for a better relationship with Christ. I know by reading this has changed my view about my Lord and Savior. And I have a reverential fear for my Lord. He is the awesome Son of God. And no words could ever describe Him. But this is going to be, this will be an embracing of the Antichrist and a rejection of Christ. These are those that will not take his mark. All right. And he shall be tormented with fire, brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. And the word torment here, it means to inflict pain, to torture with fire and with brimstone. And brimstone is it's, it's just an inflammable mineral substance. So it's going to be very inflammable. It's going to be incredibly hot and very painful. And unbelievers will be inflicted with this. Whether you want to believe this or not, and you think this is some fairy tale, it doesn't trump the word of God. This will happen. Okay, in verse 11, And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they shall have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. All right, so this is forever and ever, guys. <laughs> I don't know where people don't get this. In the Greek, it literally means unto the ages of ages. It never ends. And this should teach us that there is an endless torment to those who do not repent. This is a hopeless state because there's no end. All right, have you ever burned yourself, even just a little tiny burn on your finger or somewhere? It hurts. I'm telling you, getting burned and it hurts. Right, just the slightest little burn. Now, now think about that slight little burn and then think about being consumed in that burn all over your body, every place burning and burning and burning and burning and it never, ever ends. This is the final abode, the final resting place the, to those who do not accept Christ and for those who take this mark. Think about this too. I've never, okay, I've never had a nightmare. I'm not going to get into this, but I know millions and billions of people have had nightmares. I can only imagine when you wake up from that nightmare, you're like, oh, and you're sweating. 
and you wake up, your heart's beating, and you realize you're back to reality. Oh, thank God that wasn't true, right? Think about living that for the rest of eternity in that nightmare that never ends. Never. Let's look at Jude 1 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going to, after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. What kind of fire? Eternal fire. And a little bit further down, referring of those that end up in hell in verse 13, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved to the blackness of darkness forever. And you know what? When I hear people say there is no hell, I cringe. Because Christ spoke of hell more than he did heaven. And it's also a sad state. And I've heard people say this. Yep, you're right. I'm going to hell, right? When I get, I'm going to hang out with my buddies in hell. They don't get it, man. They don't get it. They somehow think they're going to have this grand time in hell. I've got news for you. You're not going to. Jesus spoke about this. Mark chapter 9 and verse 45. And if your foot offends you, cut it off. It's better for you to enter, enter, better to enter halt into life. Is that halt? Yeah. Halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Right? You're still having trouble believing it's eternal. Matthew 25, 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment how could we not exclude this from scripture how could we not ex or how can we exclude this from the bible and teaching it other people need to understand what's coming and what their eternal existence is going to be forever and ever i mean it's one thing to be punished right but it's to continually be punished for all eternity is something else. And if this doesn't upset you in your spirit, I don't know what's going to upset you in your spirit. This is horrible. Horrible for the lost. And I pray that this alone will touch us enough to begin to love those that are unlovable. I pray for those that despitefully use you. Right? Right? To reach out and help someone that really needs the help, that needs that Jesus in you. Because you just might help lead them into Jesus Christ. I pray this opens our hearts, all of them, to reach out to the world in a way that we never reached out to them before. Right? Everyone at the sound of my voice, all you need to do today to receive Jesus, that's it receive Jesus Christ and I pray that you accept him as your Lord and Savior once and for all remember if you choose to reject that knock on the door of your hearts then what has just been said in this scripture and in this study will be the fruit of your denying Jesus Christ there may never be a tomorrow today is the day of salvation and there is not a single person alive that has to go to hell not one. Jesus Christ paid for all sins, here, now, and forever. And many people don't understand how easy it is to accept Christ and be forgiven. They'll say, it's not that easy. Right? See, that's what the people that think you can lose your salvation say. It's not just as easy accepting Jesus. Right? Well, he's a gift, isn't he? Well, yes. Okay, well, do you accept a Christmas present? Yes. Well, it was pretty darn easy, wasn't it? <laughs> really? Do you do you take birthday presents? Well, yes. It's that easy. It's that simple. Why not accept the greatest Chris, Christmas gift, the greatest gift of all, the greatest birthday present? Eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave.
I mean, there's billions and billions of people in hell right now. And many of them that are in hell are very religious. Many trusted in their religion and many trusted in their works to get them there. Not Jesus Christ. And everyone listening, you don't have to go there. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together. We thank you for the study. We thank you for your words of truth. We thank you for your mercy and your grace, and we thank you for your judgment. We thank you in every aspect of who you are, the righteous judge and the merciful lamb, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the lamb, the lion, and the judge. As a lamb, you comfort us and help us and minister us as a lion you are there to fight for us you are the king of kings and the lord of lords and as a lion you are there to fight for us but as a judge you're also there to tell us when we've done wrong so that we can live a better life for you and we thank you for each one of these characters of your life we thank you for everything there is about you the creator of heaven, the earth, the Lord above, the Lord of all earth, under the earth, the heavens, in the heavens. You are the God of all creation, Heavenly Father, and we give you that glory. We exalt you. We give you that honor, and we thank you that you have loved us enough to come down, be manifested in the flesh as your son, Jesus Christ, who came to take away the sins of the world. I pray that everyone at the sound of my voice and listening will accept you as their Lord and Savior and get it in their hearts, not just their heads. Many may have just repeated a prayer after me and were told you're in the family of God, but you've never got it in your heart. And I pray that everybody gets it in their heart and they accept you as their personal Lord and Savior because this time's not going to be fun. And eternity is eternity. Heavenly Father, anything spoken in the flesh, let it be cast down, let it be burnt. We thank you again for all things, but everything that is spoken in spirit and true, I ask that you allow that truth to penetrate everyone's hearts and change their lives, change their outlook on things, including myself, Father. We thank you. We ask that you bring us back. We thank you that we're still allowed to actually come together and read and study your word. So in all of this, Father, bless everyone that's been coming. Bless everyone that's not been able to come. In all things, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In your Son, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen. Guys, keep the faith. God bless you.